Let's talk singing. Okay, great. So yeah, welcome, Emer. Thank you so much for being here. It's so nice Thanks to have for you. Having me. You're um you're the first person now that I haven't uh, known before doing this series. So everyone so far has been friends or family or acquaintances, and it's going to be really interesting because. I've kind of heard your name circling. Once I went down this route of this, the voice science, mm-hmm. your name just started to come up all the time and I heard it. And then I saw you on Instagram and I saw all your posts and read your bio then on your, your website. And, uh, and then, yeah, and then I made the contact. I was like, oh, very exciting. <laughs> because- Wow, very exciting, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, can you tell us maybe a bit about who you are and maybe kind of where yeah, where you started or how you got to this point. Yeah, life. sure. So it's, it was really exciting for me as well to get your message on Instagram because even when you said that you heard kind of my name thrown about for some other people, and I thought, ah, what I'm doing must actually be working, yes. <laughs> which is great, which is great news for me. Um, so the like, the kind of who I am and my background and stuff is a, is a long kind of winding story, which I think everyone in this industry ends up having that kind of weird origin. But the, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm a voice teacher based in Dublin. I specialize in voice rehab, so I'm learning much more about singing voice rehabilitation and the kind of competencies you need for that. Um, And I teach in Dublin and online. I also do some vocal health training for BAPAM, which is the British Association for Performing Arts Medicine. So it was that came out with a long winding story, which I might come back to later as well. But that's been really that's been really fun. And we've been doing that online as well because of COVID. So that's been cool. I've done a few of those. Um, and recently I launched my business, Vocology Ireland, which is providing voice science and voice health education and resources to Irish singers, Irish based singers and singing teachers. So that's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. So a bunch of stuff. Mm. I also have a couple of other day jobs that pay the rent, which is not at all unusual for people. <laughs> <Very in art. laughs> so yeah, I try and squeeze about, you know, 30 hours out of my 24 hours a day as, as yeah. most people in arts do. Um, but my background is kind of, it's kind of like, I suppose, a bit random, not random in Ireland, but maybe for anyone watching this from outside of Ireland. Um, so I started my kind of singing journey, started with Shanlow's traditional Irish singing. So, which is, that's just what I came across because I was in an all Irish speaking primary school. So that was the kind of music that you were exposed to when you were younger. And um, I did a bit of that. And then I kind of, I saw a sign in my local spa shop for piano lessons. And then I kind of annoyed my parents constantly until I gave in and we're like, okay, you know, you'll do piano lessons. And I did the same thing with, with singing lessons. I just, I, I just wanted to know like what, how you did it, what was going on, everything. And I started singing lessons, I think when I was like 11, 10 or 11, that kind of age. And that was like all the stuff that you do when you're younger, like music theater and you do a bit of classical, you do a bit of this, a bit of that. It's all about the kind of fun and the artistry behind it. And I kind of did some music theater stuff because that was always great fun. And I ended up kind of branching into classical stuff, kind of more focusing on it. Like I did like my, Royal Irish Academy music grades and all that kind of stuff and then ended up that way when I was around 18 and I ended up going off to the University of Birmingham to do my undergrad in music which was another long interesting not interesting story to look into. <laughs> I ended up over there in the UK and that was that was an amazing degree in a university that I got to try again like 50 bazillion other things during the undergrad loads of different societies and all that kind of stuff so that was really fun um, and that was actually the first time I saw an opera was in the middle of my undergrad degree so like loads of my colleagues they came from real musical families where they grew up with like classical music around them all the time and then operas and all this kind of amazing stuff i had never seen one and then we got this essay assignment when i was there it was about like the political ramifications of like mozart to pant operas or something some long-winded essay title which i read and was like what (laughs) maybe i should see an opera because i felt like a real kind of fraud because i'd never come across them before so then marched off to the concert hall and I went by myself because all my housemates had seen this opera before it was Puccini's La Boheme which is like one of the most common first operas anyone ever sees because it's unreal you should go see it um but yeah I went to see it it was the first time I'd ever seen one and I just was like bowled over by the magic of it I just couldn't understand they, they had no microphones you know, they were just on stage, thousands of people, and you could hear them from every corner of the theatre. And I thought, like, how, how do they have the same body that I have? And they can do that. Like, I don't know, there's just, I just, it just got me. And then I thought, I want to know how you do that. 
Mm-hmm. And it was extraordinary. And like, spoiler alert, uh, Mimi's like dying for, you know, like 20 minutes at the end of the opera. And it's just like the emotions that go with it and everything. It was extraordinary. And the pain that you can convey in your voice. And it was just beautiful. And 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 she she dies and I'm in floods of tears and I'm next to two complete strangers. And <laughs> like, we're in England and I'm like, I'm Irish, so I'm used to chatting to strangers because that's what you do in Ireland. And then in England, it's you maybe don't do that quite as much. <laughs> and I was chatting to your man next to me and I'm like, oh, it's just like, it's so touching. And he's like, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was fascinated by it. And I thought, I want to know how you do that. And the most logical way I could come up with of how you do that is by doing it. So I decided mm. opera, that's what I want to do. Mm. And I started training in it. I majored in performance for my undergrad. And then I came back to Ireland and I went to the Royal Irish Academy of Music. And I did some like teaching diplomas for a couple of years while I was working on the opera stuff. So a bit of, bit of everything, two teaching diplomas I think I did there. And then I did my master's in performance wow. and some my first year of that. And then I took a gap year after the first year so that I could pay for the following year. And in the gap year, I worked full time teaching. So I just did a lot of, a lot of teaching, singing, it's a couple of other day jobs and stuff. And then I went back for my second year, um, which had more operas in it and did a couple of roles there, which is really fun. I also did like some ensemble stuff with Irish National Opera and Opera Theatre Company and RT Concert Chorus and like a bunch of concerts, the usual kind of performing things everyone gets up to. Um, and that's kind of, that was like the performing side of things. Mm. Um, but I kind of ended up in this voice science, voice health thing, like by accident. Cause I've, I'm just, I'm a real geek. And like everyone that knows me, like I'm, I'm a real science geek. I just love, like learning new things and, and figuring out how things work. Like mm-hmm. I love it. And in my family, they weren't musical. Like my immediate family is not a musical family. My kind of my extended family, like I have a couple of uncles that would know whip out a good party piece. And I have a cousin who's in um, uh, this amazing band called Shukra, which you should check out cause they're unreal. Yeah, um, but like apart from that, it's mostly like medicine and science and, and mm-hmm. business and those kind of things in my family. So it was like normal in my immediate family to be a massive geek. I always have been and I kind of didn't realize that that wasn't the norm in the voice mm. industry until like other people would say it to me so like when I was researching I decided to major in um, like a research dissertation in my master's so like a typical normal day for me would be like I'd arrive in at the academy in the morning to like warm up you know do a bit of practice have a performance class for like two hours or something where you're doing like song class or opera class or something and then I'd head off to the library and I would sit in the library for like six or seven hours until they kicked me out and that was just normal for me and I didn't realize that was weird until my friends were like, but Emery, like, what are you doing for six hours in the library? And I'm like, I'm just reading. Like, I'm just learning. Like, it's so fascinating. <laughs> and it was just, it was, the, I mean, it got to the point, like I had my spot in the library, like, like Sheldon in the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> I still, when I go into that library and I see someone sitting in my spot and I'm like, spot. I mean, like years of me spending the library's budget buying, you know, obscure voice health and voice science books and, like that was, that was just my life and that was normal to me. And then I would talk about the stuff that I came across with my friends and they'd be like, my singing colleagues, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, I've yeah. just no idea. And so I started explaining this kind of stuff to them. And I realized that there was this kind of gap as well in language between us in the, in the singing community and those in the, like the medicine and science communities. And mm. since my, my mom is a doctor, I grew up surrounded by like medical jargon. So it was normal for me to like translate that into normal human speak. Mm. And that's kind of what I ended up doing with, with, with my research. I went off into like that kind of a direction. So I decided, cause as you know, because now you're getting into this voice science kind of rabbit hole that you get to in Ireland is it's not maybe the easiest to find like Irish specific things on this or people in Ireland that even talk about it. Yeah. And that was kind of anecdotally something that everyone knew. I mean, that's something everyone knew when I, when I was doing my master's research as well. Like we all kind of knew that there was no, education on on this specific kind of stuff in in our kind of upbringing as singers and Mm. everyone kind of knew but no one had really said it so i decided maybe my master's research should be um, saying it and like interviewing singers and and singing teachers on kind of what they knew about voice health and voice science and if they wanted to learn about it or if they were Mm. interested so i did um i like a questionnaire around um the royal Irish academy and dit in dublin as well and cit in cork kind of asked singers like what they knew and um 
if they wanted to learn more about it and teachers as well. And there was like an overwhelming consensus of, of everyone that I researched or that I surveyed in the, in the questionnaire that they wanted to know more. Mm. And when they went through it and answered some of the questions, they realized that there was this extra stuff out there that they kind of didn't know about. Mm. Um, so that was really fun. I ended up in this like rabbit hole at the end of it. And the thing that I'm really interested in now after doing all of that research is this kind of concept of health literacy, which is a funny phrase when I throw around people are like, what's health literacy? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's basically like the ability to, to access um, information and to understand it so that you can make appropriate decisions about your health. So like, for example, if you go to the GP and you have something wrong with you and they explain it in a way that you don't understand, you're probably less likely to listen to what they told you to do mm. than to actually do it. And it was the same with, with singers. I was finding like, if we don't understand something, like what will make us change a behavior? So an example I would give when I'm explaining this kind of thing is like drinking water. Like singers are always told like, oh, you should drink water. Like you should hydrate, you should drink water all the time. And it's like, if someone telling you to do something is necessarily gonna make you do it, you know? So I was like, what was the thing that makes you change the behavior? So it's not just being told to drink water, it's being educated as to why it makes a difference to your voice. So then understanding why you should drink water. And then on top of that, providing access to water, like maybe introducing a water fountain in your conservatoire, and then changing the social norms about drinking water. So like if all the other singers are drinking water, you're more likely to drink water. So then that is a good kind of health literacy situation because you've had a full understanding now of why it should happen. Therefore, you're more likely to do it. Mm. So it's kind of that rabbit hole is how I ended up doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just I have like so many things that I want to change, which we'll get to um, when yeah. we come later on. But that's kind of how I ended up here. That's amazing. <laughs> that's so cool. And can why do you think that there is so much um, I mean, I guess I'm, what you just explained there, I mean, if you kind of, if you, people want to be educated, we, people want to be, want to know, not just um, the, you know, not just someone saying drink water, but actually why and what it does and the effects on it. And, um, but it's incredible that you did this survey and there were so many people, were so many teachers, were so many students and singers that wanted to know this stuff. So it, it must be like, it's obviously like not just being nerdy, but actually also being just inquisitive and curious as a person, as a human. Mm -hmm. They kind of want to know a bit more of why this works and why, like you said, when you saw the opera kind of listening to this, to Mimi sing or whatever it is mm -hmm. and kind of, kind of going, how is it that I have this and she has the same thing and we have the same body kind of, and she's able to do this. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think when, as I'm, I'm the same, I kind of grew up in a, in a sense of like doing a lot of musical theater, a lot of acting work, a lot of things like that. And we never really asked why. We never asked. We, we, I went to singing class. We all had singing lessons. We all had amazing theater pieces that we were doing, taking on great like Les Mis and Rent and Saigon and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. we never really thought of, we were just kind of told, ah, you're a baritone. Here, there's the part. Yeah. Oh, there. I first run into my kind of stumbling blocks is because I don't my personality anyone that knows me watching this will laugh but my personality is not to to do something without asking questions I'm a yeah. real I'm a real question asker which like if you're my teacher it's a blessing and a curse because yeah. <laughs> it's a blessing to have a student that is that invested in learning and to just want to know all the things and I work really hard so like yay all of those things it's a real challenge to have a student that will question all the time and it's not questioning authority it's asking all of the extra questions that usually yeah. no one like or fewer people will ask you and it's i'm always i've always been the one that asked that mm. and it got me in trouble sometimes mm. it still gets me in trouble mm. it might get me in trouble doing this thing that i'm doing currently mm. but i'm just doing it anyway because i think i think we should be able to ask questions and questions should be celebrated and i think i'm really lucky that i did um end up with a teacher that was okay with all of the endless <laughs> questions that i had and if he couldn't find an answer he had enough kind of presence of mind to go off and say, listen, you should go off and find the answer if I can't find it. Like he wouldn't yeah. have, he wouldn't have been, like the ego wasn't there for him to be like, stop asking the question. His yeah. reaction was always, that's a really cool question. And when you find out the answer, or if I find out the answer, like let's talk about it. Yeah. And it'll make, it'll make the situation more interesting. And I think once I found someone like that, then it was just the beginning of the end. Because yeah, exactly. There was no going back. Like, no going back. It's like, there's another person out there who thinks this stuff is interesting. <laughs> 
And uh, also, actually, why do you think that there was so much um, not, uh, why the conversation wasn't happening in Ireland, and yet there was this huge conversation happening overseas or in yeah. America or somewhere like that? Yeah, it, I mean, it's so interesting because the, once I, once, once I did go down the rabbit hole, and as you're finding out now as well, like there, there are so many people talking about this kind of stuff in America, and then there's people talking about it in the UK, and there's you know, Johan Sundberg in Sweden, and there's people through Europe talking about this stuff as well. And it does kind of feel like no one's saying it here. Yeah. I don't know if the situation was that, that no one at all was saying anything here, or if it's just that it took, took longer for stuff to kind of seep down through the science and then get to us. I mean, mm -hmm. like we'll get to um, stuff about kind of vocology, the term itself and stuff later on, but that's kind of 30 years old now. So kind of the concept yeah. of this as a field of study is, is as old as me. Like a, I'm only 29, but <laughs> it's like, it's that kind of, it's, it's so new. So that yeah. the kind of the idea of even talking about this, even in, in America is quite new. And then it has to filter down and, and get to us. Yeah. And I'm not sure if there's an Irish specific thing as to why we haven't gotten to it yet, but I do have a feeling that there, there is a certain amount of Irish specific culture as to why we don't talk about like voice injuries and voice health things, because there's a lot of kind of, you know what the neighbors think and yeah, yeah. and that kind of aspect of our society, like Ireland has a long history of sweeping things under the rug and not bringing them to light, not talking about them. And with, with, with much more serious issues than, yeah. than voice injuries. Yeah. And recently we've changed that kind of behavior and we've talked about some really difficult things and people are having thoughts about it and there's definitely people in Ireland that are interested in this and that are doing this in their own studios. Mm. And I think it's just a question of being like, Hey, you're not by yourself. There's actually more of us. And we do have some people here that are experts in, in the fields of things like ENTs and speech language therapists and stuff that do know this stuff. It's not that we're in some like country that has no expertise on anything. I think our problem is that we do have them. It's just no one's talking to each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I want to change. That's great. Yeah. It's, I mean, I haven't been in Ireland now in uh, four years um but watching ireland grow in a sense of just as you said of, of people kind of coming out from behind closed doors pushing the rugs back and allowing things to become open beautiful conversations where people can become or feel more more included and more uh, as you said like not the only ones and yeah as it as it has filtered down we've now come to this part where it's now about singing and this tradition of irish music and singing and having fun is now something that we're actually kind of going wait on a second the people that are interested in like the technical the mechanics of it that's mm -hmm. also a possibility to learn you know i love that yeah. and Absolutely. so maybe that can bring us on to this of can you tell us what this beautiful word is <laughs> which is vocology yeah. Do you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm happy and also terrified that you ask this question because this is a question that I get all the time. And it's really funny because within even the vocology sphere, people mm -hmm. are still debating this term. Mm. And that's honestly just part of the development of a new kind of specialization is people having these discussions and sometimes arguments and sometimes debates about what you should or should not call something. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're looking online, and you, you'll find a bunch of different types of def definitions of this. And the most kind of generalized one is that it's the science and practice of voice habilitation, which even reading that as a definition, people are like, but what's voice habilitation? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, listen, if you're paying, that's what I thought as well. When I came across this term at first, I was like, eh, what? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so mm -hmm. it's a kind of, it's a term that um, Ingo Tietze kind of coined. It was him and um, another laryngologist, I think was based in, Washington and they had a chat I think informally about this and the fact that it should be a specialism that should be introduced and then I think he wrote about it officially it was about 30 years ago it's the 90s so 1990 I think and then and use the term vocology so that's that's why he's quite often you know referred to as like the father of vocology is he's the one that wrote about it first in, in a journal and then people started talking about it and he has kind of his own ideas of where he wants it to fit in and if you read um, one of his books, his book that he wrote on, on vocology with Kitty Bertolini Abbott, he has a kind of section in it about the origin of the term and where he sees it fitting in in the industry. And he sees it as like a, a parallel to audiology. So that's an, another field that's in um, diagnosing and managing and treating kind of hearing and balance related problems and other issues like that. But that industry has like another 40 years on mm -hmm. top of vocal. Like mm -hmm. that, that was coined in like the 19... 40s or 50s or something so that's been around a lot longer so with with 
audiologists, their kind of scope of practice is very well defined. And right. that's where we run into trouble, trouble with vocology is the scope of practice. That's where the issues are. And that's where people disagree. And you'll come across as well that people in America use it a bit more than people in like the UK or Europe. Like it's not as common over here just yet. And I think the it's, it's interesting because they have different issues in these different places in the world, which is quite funny for me because when I was in SVI, the Summer Ecology Institute, which we'll probably come back to later on, I was the only person who was from Europe who was at that, in that particular year at SVI. They've had Europeans before, um, but I was the only one in that year. So a lot of the time I was like flying the flag from Europe and I had to like represent all of Europe's views, which is a bit terrifying. Yeah. But I did a lot about kind of how they talked about things in, in America and over there, there's a lot of issues around kind of habilitation versus rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is like getting you back to um, normal full functioning and mm. habilitation is like enabling you or equipping you to do the things that you want to do with your voice. So okay. those things like overlap a lot, even, even just talking about them. Like for example, for someone who's not a singer who walks in and, and it's like, oh, I want to, you know, rehab my voice and get it back to full functioning for me, full functioning for, for, for them and for me as a singer are going to be two very different things. Mm. So when you're talking about even voice habilitation, like regular person on the street, maybe they want to be able to speak over ambient noise in the pub and not lose their voice. And that's voice mm. habilitation for them. Voice habilitation for me is like expanding that top octave range of my voice or something, which is not something that a normal human is going to be interested in. So there's so much gray area and overlap, even within habilitation and rehabilitation. And in America, there's lots of like laws around who can say they're doing rehab and you have to be kind of qualified, I think, as a speech language pathologist in order to say that you do rehab, even though singing teachers are technically doing it with, with singing voices and singing voice rehab, but they have to call yeah. that habilitation or else they're kind of breaking some rules. Whereas wow. in the UK, you don't have the same type of rules, like they're kind of different. And there are singers doing voice rehabilitation, some really amazing people in the UK doing, doing voice rehab. And in Ireland, there's no rules at all because, because we don't have anything about that. I mean, this is, I'm like one of the first people to be talking about singing voice rehab here. So I'm really conscious to be very careful about how I talk yeah. about vocology and singing voice rehab because I'm trying to set a good example when I do that. Yeah. But my kind of like, my understanding of vocology and being a vocologist is this is what I'm going off at the moment and it came out as a result of a long debate in in SVI which which basically the kind of end result is that vocologist doesn't work by itself for me as a as a term I don't think that you can walk around and say I'm a vocologist and then not have a second half of that sentence I think that you have an original scope of practice and for me that's voice teacher voice in, in the voice world. And then on top of that, you has, have a specialism of vocology. So I am um, a voice teacher who specializes in vocology. So a voice teacher and vocologist. There's also, you could be like an ENT in your nose and throat surgeon and a vocologist. So that means you're an ENT with like extra training in how the voice works for singing and all the extra stuff. Or you could be a speech language therapist and a vocologist, or you could be an actor specializing in spoken voice and a vocologist. So I don't think it works by itself, I think it, it basically delineates that I have extra training in certain areas, extra certification from the National Centre of Voice and Speech, and that's the difference. Mm. Having said that, word of caution to anyone that's watching, um, it's not regulated. So anyone like Mary, you know, down in Offaly can wake up tomorrow and say, hi, I'm Mary the vocologist, and no one's going to stop her because we don't have a, like an accrediting body that says you can or can't do that right. at the moment. And um, the Pan American Vocology Association are working on making this like a real regulated term. It's really complex, though, bringing something like that into into existence is really complex. So they're they've been working on that for years, to be honest. But they're, I think, in the middle of designing um, and getting people to do the final checks on their exam. So you're going to have to like pass this exam on kind of human and animal, I think, um, vocalizations and bunch of other competencies that you have to meet and then if you pass that you get to say I'm a PAVA recognized vocologist so I hope they do that soon because I will definitely be doing that one um, <laughs> but for now when someone says I'm in vocology or I'm a vocologist just look into where their training is from and um, for me I say I'm an NCBS trained vocologist which just specifically means that I've done the Summer Vocology Institute which is like you know eight weeks of just 
intense, intense learning and you get a certificate at the end of it when you pass all of your exams and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. there is, and there's a couple of, I think, universities in the US and I think maybe India is doing one as well, where they have like a vocology track as part of their masters in like mm -hmm. speech language therapy or in, in singing. Wow. So you can do it that way as well, but be careful in Ireland, just ask questions. Yeah. Ask all the questions. And I think you're, I think the way to differentiate then when the, well, not to differentiate, but also to, as you said, once you have the, what is it? The PAN, P-A? P-A-V-A, -A, PAVA. So the Pan American yeah. Vocology Association. I know yeah. it says American in it, which like, I, I brought that up with Dr. Tietze a lot at the course. Cause I was like, Hey, listen, you keep telling us to join PAVA. I'm not from the Americas. I'm from the other side of the planet, mm. but I have no organization. So can I like, can people over here join? And yes, they can. And I'm actually in the process of joining and becoming a full member at the moment. So super. Yeah, I will be in a few weeks, but yeah. yeah. But I guess that's the only, that's the only route at the moment to kind of differentiate the vocologists, the people that say they're a vocology, like Mary down the road or mm -hmm. people that have had training in vocology and this kind of putting PAVA at the front or at the end or PAVA um, um, educated yeah. vocologist or something, I guess is the way, the only way at the moment in Ireland to do that. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So at the moment, the only way to do that is actually if you have the NCBS in front of your name, so that's the National Centre for Voice and Speech. Right. Okay. The place that puts on the Summer Vocology Institute. So it's ah, NCBS okay. trained is the only way to do it at the moment, but hopefully okay. really, really soon you'll be able to say PAVA that accredited or have a something and um, I don't know when that's going to happen but hopefully soon yeah hopefully it's, it's soon. exciting anyway a lot of studying because yeah. I was kind of hoping that they would do this like really soon after I did SVI so that I everything was still like fresh but yeah. no nope, I think I'm gonna have to go back through all of it I mean I, I will anyway because it's it's me it's been a year now since I did SVI so I'm thinking I'm gonna go back through all my notes and just sure re-solidify everything because there was a lot yeah <laughs> so what was and what is SVI and who is Ingo Tietze? <laughs> <laughs> just putting that out there fair so anyone um, anyone that's watching this who who is interested in voice science who hasn't heard of Ingo Tietze yet like google him immediately like pause this pause this youtube yeah. video google him <laughs> and then come back um he's like Ingo Tietze is kind of one of the like pillars of voice science you have kind of Ingo Tietze over in America and you have Johan Sundberg and in Sweden and then Ingo Tietze obviously to coined the term vocology but like he's also written hundreds hundreds of articles about voice science he wrote like i think he's on maybe five books i don't know how many books he's on at the moment but he wrote the principles of voice production which is like one of the key texts in voice science and he wrote um um vocology as well with kitty birdlini abbott and then another one myoelastic aerodynamic something something basically his his origins are in engineering and physics so his kind of like he, he lived his life on this kind of like parallel path where one half of his life was like engineering and physics and the other half was singing and the fascination with like singing and the voice and how it worked and he kind of he couldn't give up one or the other he kind of kept going with with both of them and then this is why this ended up happening so i don't know if you ever come across do you know that phrase you know people are saying like all of the most fascinating breakthroughs happen like at the junction between two disciplines Wow, like cool. the, that kind of idea of like creative breakthroughs and scientific breakthroughs, like the really interesting stuff ends up happening because you had those two things. So it's, it's rarely because someone was like, you know, a genius and proficient in, in one field. It's because they dipped into another and, and found something, which is, it's just a concept that I find really fascinating and I'm yeah, hoping cool. to do that myself, but mm -hmm. he kind of did that. And then he just kind of, he, he's brought all that kind of discipline from engineering and from physics and applied it to the voice and and found out all of this really cool stuff he's also just i mean if you're if you're googling him you'll probably come across this stuff anyway but his um his video on straw phonation went viral as well because like he's done a lot of research into that and then out of that came like you know all of the products that we come across like the singing straw and uh the voice straw that like, Mindy Pack does with the cup and the mm. SOBT straw in the UK yeah. and Laxvox and like there's all of these vocal healthy kind of gadgets that we end up using which is kind of as a result of this super geeky kind of physics research that people like Ingo Tietze did so it's worth looking him up and also there's a really funny video on them um, he invented this singing robot that he called Pavarabati no that. I'm not joking <laughs> he is a fabulous human you just like I, know. I mean do you know what he's just and he should he, 
one of a kind. Yeah, and pause this video now and go check out that video because it's beautiful. It has Pavarotti's head and a little TV screen and he sings. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's just, oh gosh, it's just so sweet. <laughs> I mean, he's really, Ingo Tietze, I mean, yeah. So his, his reputation is massive. Yeah. Um, which is something that I did come across then before, obviously, ending up at SVI. Um, yeah. Yeah, so SVI is the Summer Vocology Institute, which is run by the National Centre for Voice and Speech in the University of Utah. So it does seem a bit random for this Irish girl to end up swanning off to Utah. Um, and I wish I could tell you that there was a perfectly logical series of events or that I found this really helpful resource and someone directed me to SVI. No, I didn't. I'll tell you what happened is I was in a library cave of studying which is <laughs> like the story of my life and i was my research was in like attitudes and practices towards vocal health in ireland but like as part of that research what i was trying to find out was like what are the other countries doing like what's what's the us doing what's the uk doing like do singers over there learn about anatomy or do they learn about vocal health or you know if they get sick do they have somewhere where they can go because i just wanted to know like the answers and while i was looking that up i completely accidentally came across the summer vocology institute website because they talk about, you know, voice education, voice science education. So it was just like a, a little trick of Google and I ended up on this website. And I, I looked at it and I just had this like weird out of body experience because they were describing this, this course that had like, you know, medicine and science and voice performance and voice teaching and voice for acting and like instrumentation and using technology to do with the voice. And they just described all of this amazing stuff. And I was like, where has this course been all of my life? Yeah. Like. I just, I couldn't believe it. I was having this flashback to like my poor guidance counsellors, you know, like, <laughs> secondary school when you kind of, you're, you're sent to the guidance counsellor to be like, you know, what do you want to be when you yeah. grow up, yeah. etc. And they look at all the, all the subjects that you pick for your, your leaving cert exams or your final exams in school. And then from those subjects, they say, oh, well, this is what you should end up doing. And like my subjects that I picked were just vast and random. Like I ended up, I was like music, but also biology and also Irish and also this. So then I did one of those aptitude tests and it was like, number one, you should be an opera singer. And I was like, lol, that's not a job. I was like, no, I didn't know anything about that when I was younger. And then it was like, two, you should be um, a doctor. Three, you should be a music teacher. Four, you should be a politician. Five, you should be a forensic scientist. Six, like it just went on with all completely different job so i'd go to the counselor and she'd be like well you should do medicine because you'll get the points um to get into the course and that's a solid career and it'll make you money and i was like thanks love yeah. not for me yeah i'm not designed for that career at all okay. but i don't know what i want to do and i ended up just picking music because it was just it just made the most sense to me it was either going to be music or politics for me and i was like mm. there we go music it is and i went into music and then i come, come across svi and it's like hey all of those things on your list you can do that in one job and yeah. i was like use me vocology where have you been all of my life and i just thought i have to do it and that was like 2017 so that was that was a long time ago that i came across this course but i had all of the fraud syndrome ever which if anyone is watching this <laughs> i feel your pain i'm i'm terrible for fraud syndrome and not thinking that i know enough about something and just being being nervous to take the leap and and do it and i saw that course and i thought like if you go on the website now, it's still there. There's a section on it that says, um, you need to brush up on your mathematics skills before you go, which like I read that and thought I was rubbish at leaving certain maths. I hated it. I had to get like extra classes in order to do well. And that I was just not good at it. And I looked at the sample test and I had all this stuff about like algebra and like, you know, physics. And I was like, ah, I don't know any of this. What is going to happen on this course? I thought, you know, and it was, it kind of comes across like it's more designed for speech language pathologists and like ENTs and stuff. It sounds really complex if you're a singer looking at that course. So I decided I'd go off and do some upskilling before I applied. Nice. And uh, yeah, and then I came across um, Voice Workshop in the UK who do amazing courses. And this was earlier on in their existence. So they didn't have quite as many as they have now. But uh, the only way that I could get the education that I wanted was by going there. So I saved up my money. I did some extra gigs. I flew over to Colchester, which meant that I had to pay the money of a flight to another country, accommodation staying in the other country for three days and the fee to do the course itself. Yeah. And that's a lot of money. And I did that like, and, and a lot of time. And I did that like with loads of different courses with voice workshop and various other things. And it was absolutely worth it for mm -hmm. me. But like, I would love in the future for people not to have to 
do that in Ireland. Um, but yeah, and then I decided I'd apply to SVI. But uh, it also costs a fair amount of money. So any, anyone who's looking it up and they've paused this and they've gone to Google it and they've looked it up, it's a, it's a hefty price tag. Um, it's worth every penny. But like, I mean, you have a couple of grand for the course itself. It's like three and a half, I think, maybe for the course itself. But then you also have accommodation, you have your flights, you have your visa fees. To, you have to get like a studying visa to go to America. And yeah. then, you know, there's like your food and, and, and everything. Like it's, it builds up. And I was not in a position to be able to afford SVI. I just wasn't. Like I, I tried, you know, I lived frugally and I had all the extra jobs and I thought I can't do it. So I applied to the Arts Council for some funding. Mm which I got, which was great. And I also launched a crowdfunding campaign, which to this day is one of the most terrifying things I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it worked and, and the community invested in me and my fellow singers invested and friends and family to kind of get me to this crazy dream. And off I went to Utah to the SVI, which was just life changing. I mean, it's like three blocks. I think when people are in America, they kind of do one block, you know, and then they come back the next year and they do another block. But if you're someone who's flying from Ireland or like one of my colleagues who's flying from Australia, you do all the blocks at once. Because yeah. <laughs> it makes more sense. And uh, yeah, so they're like divided into three things. Your first block is reading Ingo Tietz's book, Principles of Voice Production. That block is the most challenging. Well, it was the most challenging for me because it's a lot of maths and it's a lot of physics, mm. um, which I know sounds like it doesn't make any relevance at all to the voice. And in some classes, I was like, why am I sitting here doing formulas? How yeah. can this possibly be applicable? And then it got to like block two and three, which is much more about applying things and how you actually use them. And then I understood. I was like, oh, that actually is relevant and does change my understanding. Of I'm something. glad I learned that. Yeah. I'm glad I learned yeah. that. I'm very glad I also have a, a lovely engineering friend of mine who was on call all the way through block one to, to explain kind of science nice. for dummies. That's, um, yeah, that's great very helpful mm. but yeah so that was block one is that and you have like you know a couple of exams to pass as well which are a little bit terrifying but they're worth it mm. we also had in block one i mean this happened i think in my first week there second week there we dissected cow larynxes which was like nuts and i'm a vegetarian so i was very upset but also into science and i learned a lot and it was amazing you know just like seeing all of the structures obviously much bigger because it's a cow larynx but like seeing everything and doing experiments like that was amazing and we also had a, um, a cadaver lab day where we got to see like actual human larynx and lungs and like um we had cadavers that were kind of open so you could see like you know what the diaphragm was like i got to like hold and palpate the diaphragm and like a sagittal section of a head which is like if you draw a line right down the middle here and you have like half a brain and you can see all like the tongue and the wow. like i mean it was mad. And whenever I tell people this at home, they're like, Ew, Emer, what? And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, no, you have no idea. Like me in Cadaver Lab, I mean, there was maybe 30 of us in the class. And I was like one of the last three people in that lab. I was like, you'd have to drag me out. I yeah. just found it so fascinating to be able to see all of those structures in like mm -hmm. real life. Like that was mad. Um, and that was all kind of around the beginning. And then we had block two, which was like learning about different kinds of technology that you use with the voice which I mean, for me as a, as a voice teacher, I mean, how much of this pr probably will I end up coming across? Probably not that much, except for like um, spectrograms and all that stuff. But mm. like the other things that we came across, no, I'm probably not going to use it in the studio day to day, like, you know, EMGs and EGGs and all this kind of stuff. But you are going to come across it if you read any research to do with voice science. So oh. it was really cool to like see how you use them and, mm. what, they do and what they mean. So that was like part of block two. And then we also got some amazing like guest professors that came in. We had like Aaron Johnson from the NYU Voice Center. He was great. And we had um, Catherine Virgilini Abbott, who is my idol. I want to be her when I grow up. She's so cool. Um, and we had that, like Catherine, Catherine Virgilini Abbott. Mm -hmm. So she's, she's, oh, look her up. She's unreal. She co-authored one of Ingo Tietz's books with him, the one on vocology. And uh, she's just in general, an awesome human cool. and like um matt edwards who who has a blog I, I can't remember the name of his blog but it's worth looking up um who does a lot of stuff in like contemporary commercial music and rock um singing he he wrote that book that like so you want to sing rock and roll or so you want to sing gospel sing. or something like that. i don't know the name of it but mm. also good um and he did like a whole section on using mics and like amplified singing and, and how that cool. affects things, which as mm -hmm. someone who grew up in opera and classical singing, yeah. I was like, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, yeah, and like Lynn Helding was one of our guest professors who wrote this amazing book on, um, it's called The Musician's Mind, which like I would super recommend, cool. kind of neuroscience and psychology and how we learn. And, and like, it's just, she was fascinating. And um, Star Cookman, God, we just had, we had so many people and, and each new person that would come in just blew my mind in a totally different way. And I thought, mm -hmm. like, where else can you get this kind of learning experience where it's all of them at the same time? Yeah. I have to say, like, they don't have the world's greatest website. I will say that. And I did it doesn't say it. doesn't look that good. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look great. No. And like, and I said that to them. I was like, lads, listen, I came across your website by accident, but I couldn't find anything about you online. <laughs> and uh, so I said, listen, while I'm here, because people invested in me getting here, part of what I'm going to do is I'm going to post every day that I'm here, just like a picture and like a little description about what we're doing do you mind and they were like no like do your thing so yeah if you go back through my old kind of instagram posts on my own page it's so there's... interesting when you go back through your old instagram store um pictures because you yeah. really get a sense of it because i did i went I, I mean i did i went back through all of them looked at all of the yeah. posts and you really get a sense of what it must have felt like just to be there to be surrounded by this stuff and how exciting mm -hmm. and excited you were and how it came across in like a post or what you what you um yeah you know what you wrote or anything it was great i like lost my mind my like yeah. emerging voice <laughs> mind i just <laughs> i loved every second of it and the people there as well i mean i got to meet some amazing people who were doing really cool kind of work in their own respective countries and yeah. fields and, and it wasn't just like a room full of singers you know it was like speech language therapists and we had a couple of ents who were there and we had um one of the ents dr george was like this this like throat singer as well like he did all this like overtone singing it was nice. mad and like you had amazing like you had opera singers there demonstrating during class and like people doing crazy music theater belting stuff and it was just it was like i i like found my people <laughs> in this yeah. in this one place it was everyone just excessively nerding out over the voice just every day and yeah and also like you were asking about um ingo Tiza and stuff and like my, my experience with him, I think, like, to be honest, I was really nervous before I went because his reputation is so huge. I was like, what's mm. he going to be like in person? And like, have you ever picked up his book? It is dense. I mean, I couldn't, like, I tried to read it because I'm, I'm like an obsessive, you know, student work ethic. I tried to read the book before I went to the mm. course. And I got to like, I was on like chapter six of it or something. And I thought, I haven't a hope. <laughs> so dense there's no chance i'm going to be able to understand it yeah. so uh but he teaches it incredibly well and he's a really just patient person which i was like i'm so pleasantly surprised by like you, you know you could ask a question and you think i don't want to ask this question because mm. i feel real stupid like asking this question but he'd never he never responded to a question like that, that you would have thought was kind of you know dim he, he'd never respond that way he just loved that anyone's asking a question and he was very kind of open-minded and i mean disagreed on things because like as I said before, I am the person that asks a lot of questions. And yes, sometimes it get me in trouble. But let me tell you, it didn't get me in trouble with Ingo Tiza because he's just very, because he's got that kind of scientific focus in this field. When you ask him a question that does maybe disagree with something that he believes in or understands, he doesn't shut it down. He'd be like, let's talk about why you think that. And let's talk about why I think this. And then let's like discover something. And mm. it, was, it was just a cool kind of approach. And he's just also a very kind, human which was which was so lovely and, and his family as well like they kind of as part of svi they have you over to their house so we were at like a house for this kind of barbecue and and, and sing along which was just adorable and like there's ingo Tiza just playing his accordion and <laughs> you know i mean this is a, a memory that i will never lose for the rest of my life he was singing um, sweet caroline but he changed the words because his, his wife's name is kathy who was just one of the kindest humans on on earth and he changed the words to sweet Kathy mine oh, <laughs> I, just, yeah. I just died a death he's just you know he's just really lovely and um and I sang some shandos for them as well because I was like first Irish person yeah. on the course like I'll throw out some Irish not that anyone knew what was going on because it's it was you know Asquaya. but yeah. uh you get the gist yeah like, but also I'm, I'm sure it was something very interesting for them to hear anyway with this kind of shando style of singing and, and had any had any of them heard shandos before he had some? I think there was, there was one or two people that I think had come across it before, but sometimes they've come across like a, a version of that, like an international yeah. music version of that, like our kind of exports of, of right. Celtic kind of crossover stuff. Yeah. Um, but they never, 
I, well, there wasn't that many people anyway that had seen like the the full version of like yeah. hey this is you know my four verses and sad verse someone dies etc you know all that kind of stuff and that was new for them i did for the for our end of year end of year end of like i don't know course yeah concert. <laughs> <laughs> they do a concert at the, at the tita's house like a proper one where he brings all of these like fold up chairs in and all of his neighbors kind of come and oh, and everyone on the course like performs you know from their different backgrounds so you have like music theater and opera and like mm-hmm everything in between and i i performed because i was like maybe i'll do something in in english but an irish piece i sang and there were roses and that's again a very like upsetting story about you know strife in northern ireland etc and i and i did introduce it and i was like so this is from my country because this is ireland's first time at svi and i wanted to bring something from home and sang it and, and that one got got a lot of response from people as well who were like i have irish ancestors and you know it just really hits home and we're so happy that someone came from ireland and the weekend it was just really lovely like the whole the whole experience and and his family and and his daughter karen actually and taught us on the course as well because she's a speech language pathologist so she did like right. a day on kind of voice disorders and and that kind of stuff oh that day was so cool because we got to scope um it was like her and our other instructor lynn maxfield is also unreal we half the class like we divided so we each got to scope one of them if you wanted to do like a rigid scope so there's two types of um, scopes you have flexible which goes up your nose or you have rigid mm. which goes in your mouth and we got to do like a rigid stroboscopy on our instructors which just for me who's like medical nerdy kind of thing I was like this is the best <laughs> day ever it was so cool <laughs> and the, is the rigid one if I'm is that the one where you can only take a picture or is that the in is there one that doesn't have a camera that you can watch live but only takes a picture or am I thinking differently? One, the rigid one, you can you can watch it live. Like you could see, I think even if you go back to my Instagram post, you can actually see the in the so like a video of it. You can yeah. see the muscles moving in slow motion, everything on that. Mm-hmm. The kind of benefit of the rigid one is that they, for so long, had much better technology. So when you got the image of the vocal folds, you get a much better one on the okay. on the rigid scopes. Now technology is is actually moving on quite a lot. So there's like new chip tip flexible scopes where you can get pictures that are almost as good I think is the rigid one so I keep an eye on like how the technology moves on but uh, sure. they wouldn't be letting us do flexible scopes on people because that that requires that's an actual like that's a proper like manual skill of learning how to do that without getting lost in right those, you know? <laughs> it, did you also put up a post recently where there's one there's no there's two cavities in the nose um cavity place that you can go it's like one is below the other I think maybe so you can two. have if you see like if you look at like this the sagittal section of a head, which is like, you know, from that side, you mm-hmm. can see the different kind of nasal, I think they're called turbinates, kind of the name of them. Um, and it's basically like different, different pathways to the same goal, which is like yeah. to hang down behind your soft palate and have a look at your, at your vocal folds. Mm-hmm. But people have slightly different nasal anatomy. And like, if you have like a deviated septum or you have like one of those things going on, then so like your ENT will, will pick the best passage. So like not everyone is going to go in exactly the same direction, which like when I found that out, I was like, ooh, cool. So I'm going to put that on Instagram because that's totally normal. Excellent. It was so good. (laughs) And also I loved, I think it was maybe the same, it might have been the same picture where you said that you did the half of the head one where it showed all of the really detailed stuff. And what I loved about it, and I really want to thank you so much uh, for putting it up, is because most of the half, what are they called? Segal? Sagittal? Sagittal images that they put up show um like this big space of a no nasal cavity you know there's just this wide space up here and then this smaller space for your your um throat cavity or your mouth cavity and then your tongue and stuff but Mm. actually what was interesting about the thing you put up it was that it showed that there's actually these two um different uh roots or whatever it is or or passages down to your um your throat Mm -hmm. And it's not just this big space that we have behind here. Right? Yeah, Ready? yeah, I know what you mean. It's kind of like when you actually look at this might sound a bit gross to like people that are squeamish, but when I actually <laughs> held like an actual sagittal section of a real person's head and you can, you can see because it's not just a drawing that's in front of you because it's yeah. actually there in front of you, you can see the kind of bumps of the, of the nasal cavity and like this and just seeing that was so different because I think I'm the same, like when you look at particularly this simplified anatomy drawings it does just look like this big kind of hole and it's not a big hole like, right. yeah. and yeah. it's kind of 
spongy and it, 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 that's why you know when people are talking about different like resonance chambers and that's a whole conversation for another day mm, but mm. Like your kind of nasal cavity area is kind of spongy wet so like not really an ideal place for resonating because it's just going to absorb stuff you know yeah so it's like when you talk about yeah. a nasal sound you know like boing, that kind of a sound that like goes up here yeah just, and it makes it smaller exactly and spongy and kind of yeah not so kind of dull sounding in a way yeah, yeah. Okay, so interesting. Okay, I wanted to um, ask, and yeah, so then this whole this whole experience that you had sounds incredible, really. I mean, it sounds amazing. But the reason I I guess is that you want to be able to bring that to Ireland, right? Is that your yeah. kind of plan? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I want to bring actual SBI itself to Ireland, but I do want to bring like the elements idea. of that, yeah, that yeah. kind of education, and to make it possible here because. I kind of like, I'm a real believer in you can't be what you can't see. And in Ireland, when I was growing up as a singer, I didn't really see anyone that was talking about voice health at all no. or or voice science or, or how things work or like, mm -hmm. you know, as a singing teacher, how you did upskilling or continual professional development. Like I never came across those terms as a, as a young singer who was learning to be a teacher. The way I learned to be a teacher was I just started teaching. Yeah. And that's kind of the same with with so many people in Ireland is we just start teaching because there's no one else like you can't see anyone who's publicly saying like hey there's things to learn and I don't know everything and I'm not like you know some guru that's going to fix all of your problems like I'm just a person who's learning and the voice works etc and I just I wanted to make that possible for people here so that's kind of my goal I mean that the long complicated route of how I got to my goal involves so many twists and turns and and how I ended up getting there but like one of the things is in for example on that twist of turns twist and turn kind of history of me and how I ended up here is also a common thing that you're going to come across with anyone that's interested in voice health or in voice science or with many people is they either know somebody or they experience themselves some kind of a voice issue right. and like I ran into some vocal trouble which like is a long complicated story which I'm not going to get into I might come back to another time like social media or maybe mm. next week when I'm talking about things mm. but basically like the experience for me was like really kind of alienating in Ireland because I'm very kind of just you just feel really alone and like it's never happened to anyone else before and it must be your fault that something went wrong and you know all of these things that are thrown at us in the media like you know Adele cancels her tour because she's crap at singing you know like all of the vocal coaches are like oh well if she had a solid you know classical bel canto technique she never would have lost her voice absolute myth I will try not to curse on this podcast but that's just ridiculous <laughs> but that's what we're told like you know we're told like oh singers misbehave and then they get voice injury or whatever and then no one wants to talk about it because if you say i you know i ran into some trouble and you're labeled as like damaged goods and and you know don't hire this person ever again because they were like fragile or weak enough to end up with with a voice issue yeah. regardless of whether it's a really big voice issue or a really small voice issue like it doesn't matter what it is if it's like a little kind of pre-nodules you know before they're full blown nodules or if it's a muscle tension thing or if it's you know a vocal fold paresis you know that you had no control over or if you sneezed and got a vocal hemorrhage like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what happened everyone i think i think the culture in ireland specifically is like you just don't say it yeah. you just don't tell anyone and also you can't ask for help because mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go so like in your wherever you learned like in your conservatoire that you're studying in or in your like in music theater school or in wherever you were in your music school there wasn't a person that you could go to who was like the vocal health you know first aid person or there was no one there for you to ask there was just your teacher and if you think about it that's an awful lot of pressure to be putting on our voice teachers in our institution here to just expect them to to all all of them to all of a sudden have this like superior you know medical knowledge and counseling knowledge to be able to help their student like there's research out there about um where singers go for like health information seeking behavior is like what mm. it's called and where they go first to ask for help and the majority of the time the first person they ask is their singer or their singing teacher and then I'm, I'm thinking that's the first person that they ask why as a singing teacher do i not have access to some of this information so that i can tell them where to go and yeah. everything and it's just that that whole experience for me was just life-changing because i thought i'm i'm like i'm an opinionated like bossy 
person, which I'm learning to embrace the word bossy because I'm, I'm reclaiming it. I'm reclaiming my time. Thank you. Um, I'm very persistent and I'm from a background which, which has like medical jargon thrown around my house since I was very young. Like I was given a book, you know, a hundred first medical words when I was young. My mom definitely wanted me to be a doctor. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was used to that. So, so for me, as someone who's used to asking questions, standing my ground, being my own advocate, being surrounded by medical jargon, like knowing to keep asking for help, like nothing and no one is going to stop me on my search for answers. I'm just that kind of a person. Right. And if I'm that kind of a person and I found it this challenging and this isolating, like how many other singers had the same experience? Like how many other singers are out there who, who weren't, who didn't have the same upbringing as me and, you know, couldn't afford to go and find the right person who, did, who didn't have the same level of, of privilege in, in, in continuing to find someone until I found the actual qualified person to give me the answer. Yeah. Like, what if they couldn't do that? What if they were from a different background? And I thought, I would just, I would really love to change that experience for singers going forward so that you're not all by yourself. Yeah. And so that you're not kind of stuck trying to solve this problem that you shouldn't have to solve yourself. You should, you should have support from your educational institutions and you should have support from your healthcare institutions and from your government and we just we don't have that yet and in the uk i mean they've got things like bva you know british voice association and they've got BAPAM and they've got yeah. help musicians uk which like gives money towards your healthcare costs if you're if you're stuck as a musician and they've got associations for teachers of singing yeah. everywhere across the globe yeah. and in ireland you know you're just at the moment you're just a little you're a little by yourself and and you're a lot by yourself yeah. and i don't i don't want that to be the case for people going forward and i think a lot of the time a lot of times when things like this happen we kind of we look at it and we say oh well like someone's gonna do something and and change it and i thought that initially and i was like well maybe you know because things are changing in the us and the uk like maybe someone will change it here and there were people who were who were working on you know, new things like this, but I couldn't see it in front of me and, and it was so hard to access it. And I thought, maybe I'll just be the crazy person that changes it. I mean, which sounds, it still sounds mad when I say it out loud. I'm like, who am I to be changing these things or to, to presume that I can have any kind of effect on anything? And then I just ignore that voice and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna do it anyway yeah. and just see what happens. <laughs> so that's how we ended up where we are, um, which is a bit mad, but listen, if it works, it works. Absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah. There's actually someone to watch as well in um, uh, Neve Hassey is her name, who was working on setting up Voice Teachers Ireland, which is like, so that we actually would have a network. And mm. um, we were supposed to have our first um, conference of that, like our first like meeting in the summer and then COVID happened. So it, it just threw a bit of a spanner in the works. So mm -hmm. there, I think she's in the process of like repurposing and coming up with a new plan going forward. But if we had something like that, that would even be kind of just great to be able to talk to other teachers and not, not feel so alone. And then maybe it's an opportunity as well to like, you know, have a conference and learn some new skills and just networking and all that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping maybe we have that going forward. And then with my plans, there'll be like workshops and stuff for teachers and singers, Irish based and mm -hmm. online at the moment, but yeah. So various yeah. plans there. But I think I think this thing about all all the the amount of facilities that the UK has for singers, as you just mentioned, I think it's this whole thing. I think this is the problem with with well the old problem of Ireland in the sense of like people don't think that there's a demand there for it. So why would we give it? You know, yeah. there's always there's there's because there's more people, there's more people doing some things in in this you know in this topic of singing um, in the UK or US. And then Ireland is this kind of place where it's like, yeah, it's okay. there's, a, there's a couple of people doing it, but why would we really invest anything into that? Yeah. But until you do what you did, which was the survey, which was talking mm -hmm. to people, which was getting this stuff out there, which is being this Irish person on Instagram, showing stuff. And there's, there's other people as well um, that are really doing this, like, you know, just making it a thing of, of putting it out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and what I also felt really overwhelming was when I opened this door of voice science, um, the amount of the amount of resources that are out there mm -hmm. um, and the amount of great people doing it. Um, and it's I think it is always back to that thing of like, it's all it's mostly about helping, really. You know, it's like if you do, as you said, if you had a problem, if you are a singer that came into a, a problem of um, um, 
something to do with your voice and you, we need that space to feel that we can be helped um and i think that's what's really incredible about all of these resources and people um and people like yourself and people like Gemma sugru and people like you know nicola hegarty there who i've had on the the podcast or in the series because these are also these kind of irish people that are really kind of going hold on a second mm-hmm. yeah you know there is this other world that maybe as you said we're not so much speaking yeah and you know when when people say like well you know one of the reasons that we don't have things like that in ireland is because you know there the the demand isn't there for it and stuff i think first of all i think people are people are guessing you're you're guessing when you say that because you don't know because people haven't done the research on that kind of stuff like how many singing like ireland's just for example like a little bit of a tangent but ireland is a storytelling nation with Mm. a lot of singers Mm. and it's just I don't know why we have so many of them. I don't know why it's why it's so common in Ireland for everyone, even if you're not a singer, like it's not what you do. You have a party piece, like so yeah. many people have <laughs> yeah. a party piece that you whip out, like, you know, at the yeah. end of the night and there's a guitar and someone singing Wonderwall, like, you know, I don't know, like it's, it's, it's part of our culture. Like an Irish person is never going to say something directly. An Irish person is going to take 10 words instead of one word. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how like even us, like our, our, our language of Irish, uses a lot of words to say one thing like you can't just say one word like you have to use a lot of words to create a sentence Mm. and it's we kind of tend to do the same thing in in the english language as well Mm. it takes us a while to get to the point as evidenced by this podcast (laughs) from me sazzles but like that's an that's a very irish thing like you know painting the picture and telling the story and that extends into our musical tradition and that also extends into the other areas of music that we end up in like opera we have some amazing exports across the globe we have like tara rock who's singing in metropolitan national opera like in america she, she's absolutely amazing and we have like moria flavin and we have oh my god we, we have we have so many people like if you even look up at the irish opera singers that we have that are exported to other countries we have an extraordinary amount you have like completely other genres i mean we have hosier like international fame we have so many bands that that people know in other countries as well like ireland ireland is everywhere on the map and we have Irish people in loads of other countries. It doesn't suddenly make them not Irish. Like their background is Ireland. Like we, we have exported music across the globe. It's one of the things that we're most known for. So why, if it's one of the things that we're most known for, are we not able to care for our own musicians? Mm. Like it's not, it just, see, this is when you see the politics side of where I could have ended up mm. in. Like it really just lights a flame for me that we're fine exporting our musician problem to another country and there's countless clinics in the uk that have had irish singers arrive there because when you ask around and you ask other singers behind closed doors oh well where did you go and it's like well i didn't go somewhere but i know someone who went to this doctor in the uk and he fixed her so then that singer will then go to that doctor in the uk Sure. Even if it's not the most suitable one, should yeah. they'll just go there because they're like, well, I heard from so-and-so who heard from so-and-so, because that's yeah. how it works in Ireland. Yeah. And then they end up going over there. And I just think like that's also only going to work if, if you are in a privileged enough position to be able to pay to get over there and be seen privately as well in the UK, which requires like information, knowing the right people and, and a certain amount of money to get over there. Like that's just, that's not a tenable situation. And I don't have numbers on how many singers have done that. Maybe it's a research project that I might end up doing in the future. Like, I, I don't have an idea of how many singers actually would avail of a clinic if there was one. Like, I, I, don't, I don't have these kind of numbers, but part of the reason that I have that is because no one's ever talked about it. So I'm hoping we can change that, um, which is something if, if, if everyone can follow along on social media and find Folkology Ireland, I'm hoping next week, I'm not sure when you're launching this podcast, but sometime next week (laughs) hoping to do a bit of a campaign about this so basically it's not so much that i i need singers to all of a sudden turn around and be like these are all the things that are wrong with our healthcare system and why can't we do this and these are all the things that are wrong with where i studied and this is a problem with my teacher it's it's not that it's that i i would love to know your personal story and how it affected you and your journey so like were just examples like were you in a production of something and you got laryngitis like you got the beginning, like you were losing your voice, you're a bit hoarse and your director told you to sing anyway. And then you sang anyway, and then you lost your voice. Do you know what I mean? Like that's an example of a breakdown in institution communication because there was no one there to advocate for your vocal health. And then you ended up in a situation that was potentially damaging for you or 
things like did you have a voice problem and did you end up being lost and not really finding the right you know help or did you get misdiagnosed and, and feel alone or were you looking for a resource as a voice teacher and you couldn't find one or you know did you have a friend who the same thing happened to it's kind of I think I just I'd love to bring these conversations like out out into the open having said that I know how terrifying it is because I'm a singer myself and I'm on this podcast and being like I ran into vocal trouble like that's terrifying because in my head I have the Irish narrative of like don't say that Mm. don't don't say that in, in public because then people will be like well who's she talking about voice signs if she ran into vo- vocal trouble herself oh well she must not know anything do you know what i mean there's that kind of yeah. dialogue so i'm hoping to make a facility for you to send in your stories anonymously so you mm. don't have to worry about that anyone that reaches out to me i won't be telling people who you are or where you come from and i know that these stories exist partially because i have loudly been talking about voice health and voice science for a long time and people reach out to me and, and tell me their stories already. Like just, I, and I don't pass them on because I don't feel like I have the right to take somebody else's story and put it out in, in public unless they tell me that I can. Mm. But uh, people have come up to me and, you know, after show parties and been like, oh, I, I saw your Instagram post on that, on this thing. And, and I just had this question. And they'll ask me real quiet, like, you know, like, <laughs> don't let anyone hear that we're talking yeah. about voice health. And, and they'll be like, actually, you remember one time this thing happened to me and, and I was in another country because I was touring and I went to an ENT there and I saw like my vocal folds and I've never seen vocal folds before. Like it was really cool. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm sad that they were then in another country in a situation where they were worried about their voice and they saw vocal folds for the first time, which by the way, if you've never seen vocal folds for the first time, when you see them for the first time, you're like, first of all, what am I looking at? Yeah. <laughs> um, second of all, what color are they supposed to be? Yeah, okay. <laughs> It's, it's a bit jarring and I, I just love for us to have more of a like more of a an Irish based place to learn this stuff from because there's all the information is out there and there are people in Ireland that know about this stuff and there are people in Ireland that want to teach this kind of stuff and you know it's not I'm hoping that it won't always be a kind of a source of shame and shoving things under the rug because it happens everywhere and it happens in every genre so if you're watching this and thinking well I'm fine because I had classical training and everyone knows that classical training is like the epitome of not having voice problems wrong <laughs> so wrong like the the people that end up in voice clinics are from every genre it's right. not it's not a it's not always about you know you didn't have a good vocal technique like it's it's so many reasons mm-hmm. and it's rarely one reason it's it's usually because it's usually a whole bunch of things it's like a combination of maybe you were a bit tired and you sang anyway got a bit of tension maybe you had kind of like big T, small T trauma, something happened to you like a, a bereavement or, or, or a serious diagnosis or something else, which then, you know, gave you more issues. And then maybe like you had a, like a strenuous work schedule, or maybe you had a day job that required a lot of speaking when you were working as a waiter, and then you were speaking over ambient noise a lot. And then all these things all together over the course of like a year resulted in you having some sort of voice problem. Like that's, incredibly complex how that how that built up and that's not because you did something wrong that's just because you're using your voice in an athletic way and like regular sports athletes you got an injury and i just i would love to change it because like regular sports athletes i would love for you to be able to rehab the injury and then get back to what you wanted to do because that's that's what should happen Mm. so hoping that's what will happen in the future in ireland this crazy dream of mine (laughs) (laughs) that sounds interesting and it makes me want to move back to ireland just to be a part of it just to see that but what's great is that there is so and what you're good at and what a lot of people are good at is keeping up the social media keeping up this kind of free open sourced resource kind of conversation that people are allowed to dip into um and i would implore everyone to uh go and follow uh vocology ireland on Instagram and also Emer's uh, account on Instagram. Um, and yeah, and I mean, what I did on, when I got into this was I just went through and I followed as many things as possible on Instagram. So my feed is literally just that at the moment. 
which is, is something. yeah it's really it's crazy it's it's just it's literally that's the only reason i use instagram at the moment is that and yeah. some of this stuff and and some singing tips and stuff that i kind of started but mostly my feed is just full of this so anyone interested how to really do anything how to get away from looking at um at stuff you don't want to look at on on instagram or facebook is <laughs> fill it up with following people like yeah, yourself exactly. yeah no it's, it's actually there is because because you were saying um earlier on about like any anything else i feel like i should say in in, in the context of something like this one of the most common questions that i get from yeah. people in ireland i don't know if this happens in in other countries quite as much but in ireland i do get a lot of people saying like as a voice teacher like why should i bother do you know what i mean like wh- like because it is a rabbit hole it's like why why should i learn anything about right anatomy or whatever like i'm doing it this way and it's grand do you know like i'm, I'm doing it this way and it's working for me or you know so i don't really want to get into all of that and i'm like first of all i would say not everybody has to get into the crazy level of like rabbit hole that i did like i completely openly acknowledge that i'm a massive voice geek and i just live for this stuff like so for me i think this is great yeah. i don't think everybody has to do this level but like it's you know it's a line but i think what i would say to people is if it's working for you already like if you're you have like lots of experience teaching and and everything is fine for you i'm not saying that you have to upend everything and like mm. go into voice science i'm not telling you you're doing it wrong but i would say like if it is working don't you kind of know what want to know why it's working yeah. like aren't you a little bit curious and, but even if you're not what happens if it gets to the stage that it doesn't work for someone yeah. like someone said to me once is like um oh well sure you know Pavarotti when he's there you know getting out his his notes at the end of like Ness and Norma or something like he's not thinking well I have to manipulate my vocal track to be like this so that it's you know six times bigger than this space above my vocal fold so that I get my singers form in cluster so that I can really amplify that specific collection of frequencies so that I can go over this 50 piece orchestra like no Pavarotti is not thinking that in his head of course he's not that's madness like absolutely and i'll be the first person to be like no it's really unhelpful as a singer if you're yeah. in the middle of performing and you're thinking oh i should manipulate this and do this with my tongue not helpful but also if a student came to Pavarotti and he was like i want to be able to do what you do on that note and i want to get this going in this particular direction if the only tools that Pavarotti had is to teach that person the way that he was taught he's going to have like maybe four different options of how he got there himself yeah what if none of those four options work and then you run out and and you can't on the fly because of your knowledge of how this instrument works you can't come up with a fifth way a sixth way an 11th way a 12th way mm. what do you say to that student and that's what i've come across a lot in ireland is that sometimes people be like well i tried to do this in my class and my teacher did this and this and i don't really understand it and i couldn't do it and they said i wasn't trying hard enough or it was my fault yeah. and I think your biggest responsibility as a voice teacher is it is never your student's fault. If, if they cannot do something that you're mimicking or that you're imitating or that you're asking them to do, it's your responsibility to pivot and find another way for them to get there. It's not their responsibility to, to read your mind. And I think that's one of the most complex parts about voice teaching. Mm. And that's where like voice science and all this kind of stuff has really changed how I, how I look at things because it's like, hey, you have this like, huge toolbox of yeah all of these other ways that you can try and it just means that that there's just way more options for you to get to the end point so mm-hmm. it's not that i would say that if you don't know anything about voice science that you're like a bad teacher or um or anything like that it's it's mostly that it's this this huge kind of like new frontier that you can explore that will give you more options and if you don't want the options and you want to stay where you are a grant like you do you but I also think that those options should be there for the people that do want them because there is amazing stuff out there. And like the whole paralysis by analysis idea of people like, oh, well, if I know more about how the voice works, then it will kill the art and it will kill, you know, the soul and the, and the music and the storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I just respectfully disagree. <laughs> but also I'm like, I'm one of those nerds that's like, science is, is magic. Like magic is just science that hasn't been explained yet or whatever people say about that. But like for me, the more that I went into science and learned about all this stuff, the more opportunities you had as a performer and as a teacher. So it just, it opens up doors rather than closing doors in my experience. But yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, but I think that's a really good point because I kind of feel that that's a conversation I had with someone recently. Um, 
is that going down this kind of this rabbit hole of the voice science stuff, I kind of felt this disparity or this kind of disconnect to to kind of the um, the joy in which I once had at just opening my mouth and singing. Mm-hmm. You know, it, coming to this point and kind of going, wait, hold on a second, I'm learning all this stuff, but actually it might be, it feels like I'm forgetting about some part of me that actually enjoyed. But yeah. then after speaking with this person, I really did find that there is, just like you said, there is magic in the science. There is beauty in knowing that information that you can connect spiritually with it. You can, yeah. because it's a real, it's a, it's a full body experience. It's a thing that we all have. It's primal, it's beautiful. But with the primal comes understanding of when, as you said, when something doesn't work mm-hmm. and knowing how to maybe having the toolbox, as you said, all of these buzzwords, I love them to be able to, to kind of adapt that and fix that. And yeah. that's also when I, I think that's maybe when I, my, my door open or when I kind of try to go through the door as well is because I had been teaching for two years here in Germany and I had felt that, that, I was doing the whatever it is, whatever, all these scales, great, cool, cool, cool. And then there was other students coming in that, yeah, as you said, wasn't necessarily, um, it wasn't clicking with them. What I was kind of saying, okay, let's try and get through your passage or let's try and get through your, you know, your break and stuff. And they were kind of going, cool, yeah, but, ah, and I'm still doing the flip. And I said, it'll work. Don't worry. Let's keep on the track. It'll get better. It'll get easier. And then it didn't. And I was like, wait a second, why? And then I opened the door and then learned a bit about, about vowel modifications and about all this kind of stuff and tuning and the formants and all this kind of stuff. And I went, ah, okay, <laughs> right. And then I went back to this student and I asked them to do a simple, um, I can't even remember what it was. I think it was when I started using the guh, guh, guh or the mum, mum, mum or whatever it was to really add um, ease to their, um, to their singing. And then it just kind of worked and I went, okay, now I understand that there is, as you said, this yeah. massive array of tools that you can use. Oh God, there's so many. Yeah. And like, it's, it's so like, like the, the other way of thinking about it as well, of like harnessing all of this magic is when you do something as a, as a performer and something works, or like when you do a masterclass with someone and something magically works in the masterclass, if you understand how you got there, you can then harness that knowledge and use it for, for your teaching, which yeah. is just an extraordinary ability to be able to do something like that and, and make it available to to other people it's just it's just amazing yeah and there's kind of an endless amount i mean like the whole formants and acoustic pedagogy and all that kind of stuff is, is a whole yeah. a whole other rabbit hole and there's but there's so many areas of voice science like even even just really simple things like i came across a passage in one of the books i was reading um scott mccoy has this book called um, your voice and inside view which is like a, a book that they use a lot in American universities for teaching voice pedagogy, which is like something that doesn't really happen here um, in Ireland. So, which is why I got it. because I was like, ooh, a book that they use to te- teach voice pedagogy. Like mm-hmm. I should read it. And I was coming across like a line in that about um, resonance and, and in, in the context of like things vibrating within your body. And it was just a throwaway line that he had in the book, basically saying, you know, where something vibrates in, in my body, when I hit a particular resonance where it's in, it's in the sweet spot, it's in the exact right place for me, I'm gonna feel it vibrate in my body somewhere. The person that I teach who has a completely different body shape to me, like who might be completely, completely different, they might be short, they might be a man, they might be even taller than me, unlikely because I'm six foot, but still, like they, they'll be very different. So when it's in their sweet spot where I can hear it and I'm like, that's the sweet spot, it's going to vibrate somewhere else in their body. Like it's going to, it might not necessarily be where it is on me. So that kind of old idea of, Hey, you know, when you really get this Evo, like really in the right place, you're going to feel it vibrate between your eyebrows. And then you're there as a student, like madly trying to make in between your eyebrows vibrate. Do you know what I mean? Because you're a good student and you're like, I just want to do the right thing. And then sometimes they'll say, yeah, it was in between my eyebrows, but actually it wasn't. But it wasn't. And then when you get it right and you got it and it's in that sweet spot, yeah. it vibrates somewhere else and your teacher goes see that was it did it vibrate between your eyebrows and you're like yes yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's no it like... didn't <laughs> yeah. so that's even like small that's like one line in in one book of like yeah. the massive pile of books that i am constantly reading <laughs> or kind of reading all at the same time so i'm really incapable of like picking up one book and just going i like I read like chapters of like five different books at the same time. I'm dreadful for that. No, and I, I have I have a Kindle or like a little Amazon Fire thing here. And once I got into this, I started buying these kind of you know 
Kindle books, you know, nine euro here, nine euro there. And I realize now that I've, I don't know, 15 books there that I've been reading the anatomy of the voice and then being a singer oh, by Linda Ambarillo and all of these different things. And, and the body keeps count and all these great books and yeah. the body keeps score. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's that. I'm on that one as well. I think I'm on like chapter nine of that one. <laughs> I've just dipped into it. I only bought it there two days ago, but. Oh my goodness, yeah. well worth it. I'm not finished it yet. And I'm already like, why didn't I not read this? Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's so good. And so on that topic, are there more, like we'll, we'll finish up now, but are there last bits like maybe, um, okay, so there's books for resources for people, but anything else that you would advise people to, I know we've talked loads in Gotitze and we've talked many names, but podcasts or or yeah so i think like sometimes when i say things like like ingo Tiza, if that's like the first thing that people experience in voice science like he's just like bear in mind like he's he's it's a little dense like the stuff that so, if it's your first kind of foray into voice science yeah. i maybe wouldn't <laughs> advise opening his book just yet and i say that as like having having met so many people in the industry who are like older and more experienced than me who, who say that they still have to go back and read that book and like remind themselves like so don't do that one and um, maybe start a little smaller than that <laughs> but like things like i'm sure you guys have mentioned before in, in previous podcasts about like the naked vocalist is, is one of the things that people come across a lot when they're just in their podcast app and just like yeah. searching for yeah give me something on the voice everyone always ends up coming across the naked vocalist and then um, and they're great i think i think they have a, a really nice way of describing stuff that's not too intimidating and they also just sound like good crack yeah kind of people like you listen to them on a podcast you're like i'd like to have a point with you do you know yeah, what i mean so, exactly um yeah so absolutely then there's like i love on instagram there's there's so many like many 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 accounts that you're probably also following as well that i think i'll just share more of when i'm like doing my stories and stuff that people couldn't catch there but like i love it's like one of my personal favorite people on this earth who i've never met but i think if i actually meet her i'll have like a little fangirl moment it's um, Shannon Coates who does like the voice pad um, Instagram account. She's just <laughs> gas. Like, <laughs> she's really funny. I think you um, you might follow her because I think you shared one of her posts the other day. But she's, uh, okay. I just yeah. think she's hilarious. Like she she was following me throughout like my SVI journey as well. And um, I like you know the I think someone the other day shared again this this picture of like the coins with the vocal folds as like it to put it in context. I came across like that coins photo like last year when I was doing SBI from one of the professors in SBI that he was Matt Edwards like posted this on his Facebook and I saw it on his Facebook and was like Matt do you mind it's going to seem like I'm stealing but do you mind if I do it with Irish coins <laughs> and I was like no go ahead I was like because I'm posting something every day or whatever and he was like yeah and I did it with Irish coins and then Shannon found me on, on Instagram and was like oh I must do this with Canadian coins and I was like this woman is so good <laughs> She, I love her Instagram and she has a website as well and does like an online course for voice teaching and she just, she's a real voice nerd as well and she kind of speaks like the way she is, a mm. bit bizarre and I love bizarre people because mm. they just make me happy. Yeah. yeah kind of um, Voice Science Works as well, it's another kind of website, I think they've done one or two podcast mm. episodes and interviews and stuff as well but their website is a nice resource because it kind of makes things you know, easier to understand from the voice science side of things. And they're one of the first kind of websites that I came across when I ended up in this like sphere of trying to understand voice science. So they're pretty great. There's countless amounts of books that just always happen. Um, voice Workshop in UK are worth looking up if you're into doing any kind of webinars or courses. They run a master's in voice pedagogy as well, which is like, if you're into it, that's an option. They're doing like an international, you know, um, version. So you can do it online. You don't have to actually fly over like I did a bunch of times. <laughs> you don't have to do that, which is great. If this existed two years ago, I would have done it. Like I would have absolutely been like, I'm gonna do a second master's while I'm doing my first master's. Like I would have been that crazy person. So it's probably a good thing I didn't end up doing that. But um, yeah, they have like wonderful tutors on that course. Like they have um, Ken Bozeman, who's like the, the ultimate human when it comes to acoustic voice pedagogy and all that kind of stuff formants and everything like Ken mm -hmm. Bozeman is where it's at he's also got two books and mm -hmm. um, I ended up buying his second book before the first book accidentally um, and the second book is like you know much easier to understand language and wow, kind of okay. things so would recommend that um, small little green one kinesthetic voice pedagogy or something I think it's called it's like he's on their course and they have like Kerry Oberts who's done all this amazing research into um twang and and twang and the tongue and all this kind of thing she's unreal um, and they have Geneva Williams who I cannot recommend highly enough Geneva Williams actually has her own website as well called um, 
Evolving Voice, I think it's called. And she runs a bunch of webinars and courses as well. And she's providing them online during COVID, which is unreal. She also has a book, which I cannot recommend highly enough, which is called um, Teaching, oh gosh, Teaching Children Young Voices, I think. Um, she, it's because if you're kind of starting out teaching and like most people are in Ireland, you just start out by teaching. And the first people that you will probably teach are young kids who are coming into music schools. And there's just certain parts about that that are, if your only experience has been like third level teaching, and then you go to teach little tiny humans, yeah. little tiny humans with their little tiny larynx, it's a different situation than big human with your fully developed larynx. And there's different health considerations and different ways that you would teach them. And with boys and the changing voice, like there's so much information in that field that I would mm, recommend excellent. also knowing. Um, and that's a great book to kind of find those things in. Um, she's been, she's been really great actually, because she was one of the first people whose courses I ever went on in the UK. And I kind of went on my big diatribe about how I wanted to change things in Ireland. And she kind of like, cause some people, when you go on that ranch, they're like, Oh, there goes Emer again, <laughs> going on and on about all the things that she wants to do, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. But she kind of was like, that's really interesting. You should do it. And, <laughs> and I was like, Oh, um, really? Can you help? How did you do this thing? And she's like, oh, I did it by doing this. And she was really helpful in like guidance of where I, where I should go next and all this kind of stuff. And she's, you know, a large reason why I've ended up working with BAPAM as well. So like she's, she's really helped a lot. She's actually starting this new initiative, which you guys should also check out called Vocal Health Education, which is at the moment um, a UK based thing where they're kind of providing um, it's a nonprofit thing where they're doing vocal health kind of first aid teaching and they have these three levels of like, you know, basic vocal health knowledge and then like a more and more advanced amount with voice rehab involved and then like the top amount, which is like voice rehab and everything else. Sure. And, and uh, it's really cool. She's doing it with Stephen King. Stephen like King, I was just going to ask. Yeah. 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 Um, so that, keep an eye on that for exciting announcements and stuff in the next while. That's going to be really cool um gosh there's just so many resources <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean the ones that you've just mentioned they're fantastic you know i mean the things that like, i think those as you said like dip your toe in like i have done i guess i haven't gone i, I know there's the vocology book from ingo Tietze that i was looking at it cost 150 euro anyway because it's so yeah, you yeah. Know. maybe just leave, leave that one for a while yeah I, mean, I prefer i prefer watching some little interviews that he had because he's a lovely person to watch and actually he's from yeah. germany and grew up during the war and stuff like that so it's really interesting um yeah just to read about his story and kind of look at him from afar and respect him but not yeah. necessarily uh, go deep into what he's doing just yet because as you said there are these kind of naked vocalists john henny is great things like that mm -hmm. um but yeah, so I've taken a load of those down and that's going to be all down in this <laughs> lovely little black space um, oh. and also in the comments. Yeah, I mean, um, okay, so last question then, Emer, last one. I know it could be a long-winded one, but maybe you can make it as succinct as possible for yourself and for, for the time and stuff. Um, life after COVID, how are you feeling? What's the old, how's the old, uh, the old online stuff going? And do you see it kind of being a prolonged uh, thing that you might have to keep or what's your kind of experience at the moment? Yeah, so I, I think where I'm at at the moment is I'm following all of the kind of voice science developments from around the world, so like what they're researching in the US and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the NATS, the National Association for Teachers of Singing did a uh, like a webinar thing about that yesterday which I didn't tune into live because it would have been the middle of the night but I'm going to watch it today and see what they're suggesting about going forward I'm going to keep an eye on like our community numbers in Ireland and that's how I'm going to make my decision of whether or not I go back into in person but I'm very cautious about it and I'm going to stick with online teaching if it keeps my clients safer um I, I'd hope to get back to in person at some point um yeah my, my my dream scenario for going forward post covid is when we're back to seeing people in real life is i'm hoping to be doing some workshops um which i'll be announcing like through my website and social media and stuff to educate singers and singing teachers at an affordable rate so that you don't have to leave the country etc um i'm also hoping that when we talk about it a little bit more and and singers talk about these kind of issues more that maybe some third level institutions might realize that this that this kind of specialism is is 
valid and necessary from their students and I'd love to work with some of them in introducing some of this into their curriculum possibly um, and things like that going forward so workshops education all of the things attempting to keep doing what I'm doing on social media good luck to me <laughs> well, you're doing so many good things yeah. so far so please do keep it up because I'll, I'll be liking it and following it and sharing it anyway so you, at least you'll have me but uh, Emer, thanks so much. This is really, this has been really great. Really has. Um, for having me. And thanks for doing this podcast. I love this idea. It's so great. I'm Get glad. Some more people talking. Yay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I have some really cool people coming up as well. It's going to be, you know, it's growing and getting a bit of traction and stuff like that. But for me yeah. personally, it's just about, really, it's just a public learning platform that I'm just, you know, squeezing people for their information, um, but also yeah. making us some sort of a resource for other singers to also mm -hmm. engage in this conversation, I guess. Great. Well, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Okay. Well, great. Uh, I think that's the last one. Uh, last question. I usually always ask people about what their favorite or go-to warm-ups are, but. <laughs> Goodness. Well, do you know what? I'm doing a BAPAM Introduction to Vocal Health webinar in August. If you I check just out like yesterday. And uh, that I do mention warm-ups in that and the kind of like sequence that I would go through in that in Geneva Williams book, Teaching Children and Young Voices, she has a good section on warm-ups as well, which is what I kind of go off in that webinar because I like the way that she kind of phrases it. I always start with, um, since, since I came across her saying it in a lecture, with um, warming up your mind and your mindset before you start. To even if it's, and when I say that, people roll their eyes. And I know that because I'm one of the people that rolled their eyes about this. Mm -hmm. um, I did, but even if it's 10 seconds, it's like 10 seconds of you, if you're standing or if you're sitting, just breathing and then realizing what is touching the floor, how your body is in contact with the earth, deciding what you're going to do for the next X amount of time and just getting your mind in the right zone before you start completely changes how you approach what you're doing. It just okay. really does. It's like, that's how I start. Then there's a way long and long winded answer as to what I do for the rest of warm ups. So maybe I'll come back another time. We can do that. <laughs> be fantastic yeah and, and and i've 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 bought my ticket for the webinar in august anyway so i'll see you uh, or you'll see me at least maybe in the yay yeah. <laughs> okay great emer thank you so much um have a lovely day and thank you for all the information and yeah hopefully it'll be getting out soon the podcast or this little series um but yeah i'll let you know perfect cool no probs see you soon